أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم قل هذه سبيلي أدعو إلى الله على بصيرة أنا ومن اتبعني وسبحان الله وما أنا من المشركين رب الشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد Once again everyone, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh and today I hope to present to you the third and final session on ayah number 108 of Surah Yusuf We've talked about a number of things starting with an entire session dedicated to Qul hadihi sabili, this say this is my path uh, and we talked quite a bit yesterday about Ad'u ilallahi ala basiratin ana wa man ittaba'ani uh, I call to Allah with, uh, you know, based on or standing on vision, I and whoever follows me. There are a couple of outstanding items um, about that phrase. And then we wrap up the ayah with the last phrasing of the ayah. Two things that are said in addition was subhanallah wa ma ana min al mushrikeen. So let's start with the phrase, I call to Allah with insight, uh, ala basiratin. Uh, and something that you know, uh, Al Qasimi actually Mahasin uh, Ta'wil mentioned that's really beautiful. He said that the idea of ala basira also means that he that the one calling to Allah in this case of Rasulullah sallam has an eye on reality, meaning he's looking at situation the situation around him, and given that situation, Allah gives him revelation that calls to Allah responding to that situation. Now to put that in less abstract terms. The idea is that the one who has this kind of insight isn't just, you know, preaching prepared speech. Is someone who understands how how to call someone back to Allah, no matter what the circumstance. Somebody comes to them, somebody, you know, like give the example of a scholar, for example. Somebody comes to a scholar and says, "Hey, um, I want to purchase a home. Uh, do you have any advice or whatever? They want a fatwa or something." And that would be a good time for the scholar. That they came to to seek advice from to talk to them or to remind them about the idea of ownership or a lot you know the, the principle behind uh you know the final home that we're going to have or even the ayah that these homes as important as they are don't lose sight of the bigger picture there are things that that the revelation teaches us that that might be a teaching moment of some something from allah that can inspire you or have you look at the circumstance you're dealing with in a different way, right? So the idea being that you're not imposing what you know what you came to learn or what you understood onto everybody. I I just learned this and therefore you got you everybody needs to hear this. But the one who truly calls to Allah, people come to him like people used to come to Rasulullah Different people, different circumstances, sometimes similar questions, but the answers would be different, right? So they're they're coming in at saying the same thing, what's the best deed that I can do? And his responses are different, sallallahu alayhi wa And that's an example of basira, that he's he's got a good eye on who's coming to him, what they seem to be, where they seem to be at, what their emotional state seems to be, what their spiritual state seems to be, what the circumstance seems, seems to be, and how best to address that, how best to answer that. So there's this kind of, which is at the end of the day, wisdom itself. And actually when we study balagha, that's, the essence of balagha is to actually look at the circumstance, look at the individual you're communicating with, and then find the most precise, most effective thing to communicate to them. And that's the idea of basira also, that we're not regurgitating something. We're actually looking at a situation and then seeing what we've learned, the timeless teachings that we've learned, how they would apply, and how would one call to Allah in that circumstance. Right? So, uh, interestingly enough, uh, in one of my recent lectures, uh, I use the word God for Allah and I, and I use God and Allah, the word Allah interchangeably And this is actually a long discussion Sheikh Suhaib and I have had uh, recently too And somebody took offense to that And understandably when we come from Muslim cultures Then we hear the word God being used by Christians And Allah being used by Muslims, right? And actually the flip controversy even happened in Malaysia Where Christians were using Allah and there was a big problem Right, so you stick to God, we'll stick to Allah, right? So let's just keep it clear, keep it clean, right? But the thing is, uh, you know, uh, where I come from, from Pakistan or even India, etc., uh, we use other names for God. We use Khuda, which is Persian. We use Parvardigar. We use, we use other names, you know, that are not from Arabic. They're not from the sacred literature. They are from languages that are that belonged originally to the Zoroastrians 
or to the Hindus, or you know, but we took those words and we incorporated them into our language, and it's completely okay for you know Muslims from Pakistan, India, etc., to say khudafis to each other when they're saying goodbye to each other, as if to say God is the guardian and they use khuda for him. But somehow English is the language of the kuffar, therefore you shouldn't, etc. But, but that's not the point I'm trying to make. The point I'm trying to make is the reason I use the word God is I know for a fact some of my audience kind of stumbles upon these videos as they're being live cast. And some of those people are non-Muslim. And I don't know when they might hear something that might resonate. Hey, he's talking about God? Because if I say Allah, they might not even know what that is or who that is. They might not know. It is an Arabic term. It is familiar to us. We have certain background. And because you're my audience, you understand that. But there are other people that might not. That might, or, or, or other people, like I know some people that were, you know, the father was uh, a Muslim and the mother was Christian and they sort of, he sort of got westernized, etc. And went to church his whole life, right? So knows nothing about Islam, basically. But he's, now he wants to discover more about Islam. So when he thinks of someone talking about spiritual things, his only experience is the church experience where he heard the word God over and over again, right? And that's what resonates with him. Like that's the first thing that connects with him. Well, to us, قُلِ ادْعُوا اللَّهَ أَوِ ادْعُوا الرَّحْمَانِ أَيَّمْ مَا تَدْعُوا فَلَهُ الْأَسْمَاءُ الْحُسْنَى Call him Allah, call him Ar-Rahman, whatever you may call him, the most beautiful names belong to him. And the, the argument was God isn't Allah's name. Allah is his name. I would agree actually, Allah is his name. And God is simply a description. God is the equivalent of Al-Ilah or Ilah, which is okay. It's not a substitute for God himself or for Allah himself, right? The name. So either one, like to give you a, a, a language example, if somebody called me Ustad, somebody called me teacher, Ustad is not my name, but they're using it as a title for me, right? So they're referring to me with that. So it's still referring to me. It's not an insult to me. It's not a substitute for Norman. And in some contexts, that's okay. The point being made in Ad'u ilallahi ala basira is actually that someone has a clear understanding not just of who's coming and asking them questions they have a clear insight into what society looks like what concepts are floating about how people think how people feel what their cultural preferences are you know how they operate what what has been settled into their minds for many many generations and how to understand where they're coming from and then bring allah into that equation you know not impose allah because many parts of a culture have no qualms with Allah. There, there's no contradiction between Allah and a culture. And some things there are, there is a contradiction. So to be able to pinpoint where exactly do we draw a line and how to introduce Allah in those circumstances also takes basira. And this is actually in the statement, ad'u ilallahi ala basiratin, it ties to another concept in the Quran, wa Quranan faraqnahu li taqra'ahu ala nasi ala mukthin wa nazalnahu tanzila. And so to Isra, let the Quran be broken apart and we sent it down on the perfect on the most anticipated occasion, mukth. And we sent it down gradually. Meaning people were at a certain occasion, Allah Azza wa Jal knew Allah has the He's Al Basir, and He Im inspires His Messenger وسلم, with the Basira to give these ayat at that moment, right? With the insight and with the vision to share this teaching at this moment to call people back to Allah. So that's one thing that I wanted to add to yesterday's discussion about ala basiratin. Uh, the other that I wanted to add um, is the grammatical nuance here. Ad'u ilallahi ala basiratin. And if you continue this, we, we talked about it as two separate sentences, but we didn't look at the third grammatical possibility. And that is, ad'u ilallahi ala basiratin ana. Wa man ittaba'ani. So ana is being repeated even though it's ad inside of ad'u. So I call to Allah, I, and whoever follows me, meaning and whoever follows me, call to Allah too. They do the same thing as I do. They, not, they don't just follow me, they also call to Allah. So as if in English you would say, uh, I'm the one who's teaching Arabic and my TAs and my assistant, right? So I, I could have said I and my assistant are teaching. But I said, I'm the one who's teaching, me and my assistant. So you kind of repeated yourself and then added the assistant, the additional, right? So here, the, the, the thing is, why is the ana repeated? Because the ana is already there, right? So grammatically, there are two ways of looking at it. Sometimes the grammatical response helps us understand what's justified in Arabic, but then the rhetorical understanding helps us look deeper, be, the meaning behind the meaning, right? So 
let's let's look at both. Because uh, and for grammar students, this may be interesting to you. Ad'u is the uh, has a damir mustatil, right? It's got a pronoun embedded inside of the verb, right? And that's the fa'il. That's fi mahalli rafa. The ana is fi mahalli rafa, not the one that's stated, the one that's inside the, of the verb. And then the woman ittaba'ani would be the second fa'il. It would be ma'tuf ala al fa'il. Right? So that should be fi mahal, the man would be fi mahal rafa. It would be in the state of rafa, the, the subject. I'll come back to normal human English in a, in a minute. Just let me geek this out. Okay? The thing is, some grammarians would argue you cannot put a atif, you cannot put an and on an embedded pronoun. You would have to repeat that pronoun as, an, as a stated noun because a noun needs to be ma'tuf on a noun. An ism is ma'tuf on ism. So that's why the ana is repeated so the ma'tuf could be there. So ana wa man ittaba'ani. But then let's look at this. That would be the grammatical justification of the repetition of ana. But there's another alternative. Why not simply say, uh, under the guise of khayrul kalami, ma qalla wa dalla, nad'u ila Allah ala basira. Nad'u ila Allah ala basira. We call to Allah. Or ana wa man ittaba'ani, and then nad'u ila Allah. You could say, I and whoever follows me, we. Right, so you can mention them in the beginning, make it a jumla ismiya. But then, and some even argue that the ana is actually a mubtada mu'akhar, which is really interesting, right? But what does this do? What this does is I'm calling to Allah. The statement is done. I'm calling to Allah with clear vision, and then this is this is la mahalla lahu fil arab almost. I. Did you hear me? I am, and whoever will follow me will take this mission too. Whoever will come along with me. And so there's an extra exclamation added in that ana. And then the manit taba'ani, notice the, under, the, the implied statement is, wa manit taba'ani yad'u ila Allah kadalik. Right? They, the one who follows me also calls to Allah. Whoever would were to follow me also calls to Allah. But they are not, they have not been, the verb to them has not been stated as if. It's already understood, and that's actually really beautiful because the the tabi is literally in grammar here tabi of the word ana. <laughs> like the verb didn't have to be said. Our Rasul does it. That's enough for us. You don't have to say that we're going to do it. It's already known that we're going to do it. So it's in, it, like this. It's almost as if following the Prophet sallam and doing what he does goes without saying. Once you accept being his his follower, right? So that's some grammatical nu nuances inside the ayah. So let's come back to basic. Stuff or uh, you know more simpler language, inshallah, uh, and some really beautiful things inside of these ayat. So now we come to wa subhanallah, uh, and I declare Allah's perfection. It's a hard thing to translate subhanallah. We say it all the time, but it's one of the hardest things in gra in grammar to translate. They, a lot of translations use glory be to Allah, right? Um, so let me walk you through quickly the concept behind subhanallah. Uh, the, the the idea of tasbih, uh, the root letters are seen ba and ha. Uh, they have to do with swimming or floating, uh, and the idea behind the, the the connection between floating and glorifying Allah, if you want to use that word, is that when something floats, it doesn't descend; it stays level, right? It it refuses to dip down, and the idea is what we say about Allah is never inappropriate about Him. So we maintain his perfection. Anything we say about him is suited to, to match his perfect glory. So when we talk about his wisdom, or we talk about his knowledge, or we talk about his, his you know, how much we should rely on him, or we talk about his guidance, anything attributed to Allah should be talked about in a way that doesn't sound like it has a flaw in it. Right? So that's the the tanzih, uh, tanzi, right? The idea of removing all flaw or speaking about someone in a way that no flaw can be attributed to them. Removing all things that are not appropriate to be associated with him. That's the idea of tasbih. So when and and then you should say, I declare. You know, this is why I say it's hard to translate because you say glory be to God, then it sounds like you're glorifying Allah, but you're not really talking about his perfection. And you're not really saying, I'm very careful never to say something about Allah that takes away from any of anything associated being being associated with him being less than perfect. That's actually, it's a, it's a mouthful in English. I declare that I will never say or imply anything about God, about Allah, that is short of perfect. 
his mercy is perfect, his plan is perfect, whatever ha whatever he allows to happen with me in this life is perfect. The unseen is perfect. His decision for uh, for salvation is perfect. His guidance is perfect. If it's attributed to him, it's perfect. If it's coming from him, it's perfect. His risk is perfect. And that's all inside subhanAllah. But what's that doing here? And before we get to what's that doing here, the verb is implied. I declare that he's that perfect. I'm acknowledging that I, I stand by not allowing myself to declare or to attribute imperfection to Allah. It's actually coming at it from the negative. Like, you know, not letting something sink, right? So it's not I declare his perfection, I refuse to attribute imperfection to him. It's more along those lines, actually. Which is why you find in the Qur'an, when someone says something inappropriate about Allah, you find subhanAllah. You find even when the angels got scared, when they questioned Allah, are you going to put someone on this earth who's going to spill blood? But we don't mean any, we're not saying that that's unwise. No, no, no. We're, saying you're per we're not trying to say that that's an imperfect decision. So they immediately qualified their statement. There's two ways of looking at that. Well, we're doing this bih already, so why you got to need them? That's one reading of it, right? Another parallel reading of it actually, equally consistent grammatically is, Ya Allah, we just said this, but by this we don't mean that your decision is anything short of perfect. And when he did tell them, I'll tell you something you don't know. And when he did tell them, they reinforced that we we don't mean that you have decided anything short of perfect. What did they say? Subhanaka la ilma lana. Subhanaka la ilma lana. When someone's being slandered and you recognize that that's a crime against Allah, Subhanaka ma yakunu lana an natakallama bihada. Surah al Nur. I'm not going to go take away from your perfection, your, my Rabb. I won't put, take part in this. When people commit shirk, Allah says, Subhanahu wa ta'ala amma yakulu na'uluwan kabira. So the idea of subhanallah is I do not associate any imperfection to Allah. I will make sure that my conception of Allah, my conversations about Allah, my thoughts about Allah, my feelings of, about Allah all declare the same thing, that He is beyond imperfection. Nothing He does is anything short of perfect. That's, that's inside of subhanallah. And the fact that it's, a, it's an, a powerful declaration, it's like almost as though this belief courses through my veins is captured in the fact that it's not even said as a jumla it's said in this insha'i exclamatory form subhanallah the taqdeer of it is actually usabbihullaha subhanan that's the grammatical you know unraveling of it but why is it said in this way because it's if this was a text message it would be subhanallah exclamation 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 or subhanallah it's like it's not a casual statement Right, and so when it when you get to this part, something has been escalated. There's an escalation that's happened inside of this ayah, and you can see a building now of escalations. Hadihi sabili, adu ilallahi, ana, woman ittabani, wa subhanallah, you know. And then there's a, and you could see now the logical connection with wama ana min al mushrikin too, because ma ana min al mushrikin is the worst, most the the worst crime against the tasbih of Allah would be shirk. Right? So not only do I maintain his perfection in the most pr pristine way, but I absolutely, I'm the furthest thing from people who would commit that kind of shirk. So both of them have been elaborating each other. But now let's talk about how these things are connected to each other. And there's a few things to note here that are very powerful. Uh, the, um, and by the way, uh, Mahad, I didn't forget your question about ilallah. I'm coming to that. Inshallah. So the first thing here to note is that Rasulullah has been told to take a very um, you know, self-focused claim. He's, he's being told to make a claim that brings all the attention to himself. sabili ad'u ilallah ana. You you see all that language that's focused on the self, right? And we talked yesterday about how this is not comfortable language for the Prophet, which is why he had to be told to say this. قُلْ هَذِهِ سَبِيلِي أَدْعُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ Even when Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said something like, you know, أَنَا سَيِّدُ وَلَدِ آدَم يَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ I'm the, I'm the leader of all children of Adam on Judgment Day. He, he qualified that statement with what? وَلَا فَخَرْ And there's no pride in me saying that. In other words, I'm letting you know this is going to be the case, but I'm not telling you because I need you to know that that's, that's what's up. 
I'm not telling you this to boast or to make a claim. I'm telling you this is Allah's decision. So I say this with no pride inside of me. Wala fakhar. You understand? So here, he's been commanded to say this. But also, he's even though he's been commanded to say this, somebody might hear that and they might think this is a whole this whole thing is about him and where he stands and his leadership and it's his path. And he, well, you know, he's doing the calling, even though now calling to Allah, but he's in the central role. And what does he do immediately after? Allah commands him to say, well, subhanallah. And I declare Allah's perfection. As if to say, I am not perfect. It is Allah that deserves all perfection. When I make this call to you, I am not the object of worship. I am not the object of adoration beyond what is only, only appropriate for Allah himself. And I will be afraid that I will fall short of my responsibilities as I go. Because the only one perfect is Allah. And Allah has charged me with this mission, but that doesn't mean I will execute it per perfectly. That is only for Allah. And we know that He executed it perfectly, but part of His perfection is to constantly declare His own imperfection. And to actually say perfection only belongs to Allah. Musa salam was being charged to go to the Pharaoh. And he asked for help. He asked for his brother, right? And what does he say when, when we're going to go make da'wah to him? You know, So we can declare your perfection together. What does talking to Fir'aun have to do with declaring your perfection? Well, if I lose my temper, and if I you know, say something out of place, my brother can be there to correct me. And if he's doing something, I can be there to correct him. Because... We are not perfect, that's only you. And in doing so, we'll remind each other that the perfection only belongs to you, Ya Allah. So one of the aspects of subhanAllah is actually this, uh, this aspect of the Prophet's career, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that has been highlighted in different places in the Qur'an. And that is that Allah Azza wa Jal will correct him. Allah will remind him that tasbih only actually belongs to Allah. It only actually belongs to Allah. And Allah will deliberately make him make decisions and then correct them. We've talked about that at length in Surah Al-Fatih and some other occasions. But Allah will do that to illustrate something that was a theological problem for people of Scripture before us. Because people of Scripture before us, in their love of Jesus, turned him into divine, right? And if, we had, if they had so much love for Jesus, you have to understand, the level of love Muslims have, for Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, if that love was dangerous enough to turn Jesus into divine, that explosive material is far more, uh, far more dangerous with what we feel towards Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The love we have for him, the obsession we have with him, the you know the adoration we have with him, the awe and the reverence we have for him, the room for that shirk is very, the danger of it is very high. And this is for all of humanity. And so the Qur'an keeps putting, on the one hand, we have this remarkable reverence for the Prophet Wasallam, and this like honor of him, like no king has ever been honored, no human being has ever been honored in this way. And on the other hand, it's constantly this, the, the messenger is way above you, but Allah is way above him. There's this, co this constant dichotomy that's being reinforced and reinforced and reinforced. Because... For the mushrik mindset, if you're calling us to a religion, you must want to be considered the holy one. Right? Anybody calling for a new religion, they must want everybody to basically treat them like, you know, this holy figure, this, you know, this beyond human, supernatural type being. Think of, for example, in modern religious, you know, experiences, the role of the Pope. Right? People want to kiss his hand. People want to get forgiveness by his hand. People want to, you know, they don't consider him a fallible person. Actually, the Pope is infallible. He's infallible. And Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what does he keep saying? You know, ma, ma kuntu min rusul ma adri ma yufalu bi wa I don't even know what's going to happen with me and what's going to happen with you. In a tabi'uma illa ma yuhaylaya. I'm only following what's been given to me. I'm not telling you follow my follow me. Or actually, no, believe in me or take my reverence. The reverence belongs to Allah. Let me reinforce, subhanAllah. So going back to that fundamental is so powerful and important. And this, in a much lesser sense, because everything that Allah tells us about Rasulullah especially with an ayah that has, وَمَنِ 
that means it has ramifications for you and me today. It's not just teaching us something about Rasulullah 1400 years ago, 1400 plus years ago. It's telling you and me something today. And what is that? When you and I are in a position to share something about Allah, like I am right now, I'm, I'm sitting in front of a camera sharing something about Allah, sharing something about ayah number 108 of Surah Yusuf. Somebody gets a chance to give a khutbah. Somebody gets to sit down with their family and remind them about a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. Somebody starts getting considered the, the knowledgeable guy on campus, right? Or the, the, you know, the person that I go and ask Islamic questions to. They, either they are in fact a sheikh sheikh or they turn into a pseudo sheikh or they turn into this brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so that everybody turns to for advice and counsel and things like that, right? What that means, let's put the spiritual dimension to that of that aside. What that means is you become the center of attention for maybe not millions of people, then maybe dozens of people, maybe hundreds of people, maybe 10 people, maybe five people. But it doesn't matter when you're calling to Allah and, and somebody's listening to you, then you are kind of the center of attention. And then there is a pedestal, knowingly or unknowingly, that you have been now put on. And on that pedestal, you are being looked at by some people are now die hard defending you no matter what, as if you are beyond fallacy. And then the other extreme is I'm gonna show you how fallible this guy, this person is. And their mission is to show you, to show everybody how like some people are believing you're an angel, and others need to prove that you're the devil. And you need to just stay grounded and keep. Reinforcing for yourself and everybody else that I'm just human And perfection belongs to Allah And I, you and I make mistakes And we all have these struggles There is no top-down hierarchy But unfortunately when someone You know, comes into a position of attention Then shaitan is always there trying to get us in different ways, right? So one of the ways shaitan gets to somebody who's starting to get attention is Hey, by the way, that one's getting more attention than you Did you see how, many they, how much attention they got? Did you compare? Man, they got more views than you? What? Now you're like, why are they getting more attention? Maybe I should take some digs at them in the middle of my Islamic talk. Not so direct, but indirectly. Just kind of take a couple of jabs. Just so, you know, people realize that they really shouldn't be following that person so much because they're, you know. <laughs> so what that is, is actually you are at the center of this thing. And... This uh, humanity is better served by paying attention to me So it becomes about me If there was one human being on the face of this earth That gets to say that it's all about me If there was one human being That would be Muhammad Rasulullah That would be him And in this declaration There's a lot of me in this ayah, isn't there? Hadihi sabili Ad'u ilallahi ala basira Ana, there's lots of me And then all of that me is put in its place With wa subhanallah Wa subhanallah Perfection belongs to Allah Not to me This is about Allah, this isn't about me This, is a, this isn't about me getting more attention This is a, isn't about me. you following me And even if you do follow me, that's not the purpose The purpose is I will take you to Allah Allah has charged me to help you get, get you to Allah that's, that's the goal And this mindset is a very powerful thing it, Easily forgotten Easily forgotten and so Allah is commanding His Prophet to make this declaration Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam وَمَنْ اِتَّبَعَنِي وَسُبْحَانَ اللَّهِ Now, a couple other things before I go to وَمَا أَنَا مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ We talked last time about um, confidence in our faith also Like basira, right? So you, you are, you know, everybody is proud of their jahiliyyah And we're like the only ones ashamed to declare our Islam Right? Everybody else is proud for whatever identity they want to follow. They want to you know, declare it and celebrate it and shove it in everybody else's face and say, this is who I am, accept me for who I am, accept the, you know, the, the, whatever thing I believe, and you better celebrate it along with me, otherwise you're narrow-minded. And the only ones who can't do that today, the only ones who have to just be in a corner and kind of try to fit in, would be the Muslim, right? We're, we can't be proud of who we are. We talked about that already, but there's the uh, to every everything I talk about. Sometimes there's an extreme opposite. That's the other extreme. So on the one hand, we're shy of being Muslim, shy of showing our Islam, and that's already been 
destroyed in Hadihi Sabili. It's been wrecked. That's been run over. But when the opposite of being shy is being confident, right? But too much confidence becomes what? Becomes arrogance. And then there's, we're Muslim. These kuffar are going to burn it. We're number one, baby. And it, now this became about you and how awesome you are and how beneath you everybody else is. On the one hand, we don't want to be feeble about our faith. And we don't want to be weak and feel inferior that we're Muslim. And on the other hand, the other extreme is, we're so proud of being Muslim that everybody else can practically go to hell and they, what do they have? Ha! That's a kind of arrogance, isn't it? And what's the difference between you and Bani Israel then? And inside of what subhanAllah, that's there too. Inside of subhanAllah, there is actually a, an acknowledgement that I will not go beyond Yes, I will have absolute confidence that this is my path. And I have I stand on firm conviction. I'm completely confident in my faith. But this confidence is not so I can put myself above you, that I'm more perfect than you are. Because the per perfection, that's for him. That's for him. So that, that gives you a subhanallah. Then about this, uh, was subhanallah, one last thing. Uh, and then inshallah, wa, wa ma'ana bil mushrikeen. Uh, practically every religion in the world Has some concept of God Right? And the Arabs actually shared the word Allah With Islam So the Mushrikun called God Allah too The Christians in fact in Arabia The Syriac Christians called God Allah too The Jews of Medina called God Allah too So when someone says I call to Allah Right? They can hear that and say Oh well you know thanks but we already we're good on that. We already have our faith in Allah, right? Because I say, I believe in God. Can't a Christian friend of mine say, yeah, I believe in God too? Can't a Hindu friend of mine say, I believe in God too? Can't a non-denominational spiritual person say, well, I believe in gravity too. I mean God. They could do that. They can say, I have some, want to call him Allah, that's fine. Right? So they can, the, the word Allah, which is a name to us, was a shared conception among people of different religions at the time. This needs to be clear. So then what sets his call to Allah apart? It's the subhanallah. It's the ala basira and the subhanallah. It's I'm calling to this conception of Allah with clear insight and this conception of Allah and this faith in Allah and this conversation about Allah is free from anything that can attribute imperfection to him. And that is a challenge. That is in fact a challenge to other religious views of God that no matter what religion you follow, when you take a look at the God that you believe in, you will find things that sound human, not God. You will find things that sound vindictive, not like God. You will find, find, things, find things that are unwise, unlike God. So the, the, the perfection of the concept. I'm remembering my friend John. I won't say his last name because he gets embarrassed. He was a librarian. He was not. He was uh, non-Muslim. He did his master's in uh, philosophy of religion, comparative religion, and, uh, and religious philosophies, and bachelor's in it, and then and then master's in it. And he was a librarian at a university. And he, you know, his when his second son was born, the umbilical cord was tied around the neck several times. So it was highly likely that the baby would actually suffocate at the at birth. But he was born and he was completely fine. Like there was this high chance that he wouldn't be alive and he was perfectly fine. And in that moment, John said there has to be a higher power. In that moment, he tells me himself. And he said he went back to his notes from his bachelor's program on different religions and started looking over all the religions again. Where, which God am I going to? Where, where is this God that did this for my child? Right? And he, I kid you not, his own notes on Islam, right? He said, this, this Islam thing has a God that is completely perfect. And something along these lines is what he wrote. His notes from many years ago, because he can tell as a philosophically minded, logically minded person and a critically minded person, you've got gods that emulate humanity in some way. Statues that emulate human behavior, right? Our conception of God is actually the exact opposite. Human beings should try to emulate some of the attributes of Allah. 
Allah is al-Rahim, you should have Rahmah. Allah is al-Hakim, you should try to acquire Hikmah. Allah is al-Alim, you should have you should you should rev, have reverence for ilm, right? So uh, the idea is instead of human beings projecting themselves onto a vision of God, like in Greek mythology, right? Like in Norse mythology. Instead, it is Allah's perfect attributes that are shining a light on what human characteristics can be. Like Allah's light is shining on us literally, right? And we're illuminated by that. So every attribute of Allah inspires us to be a certain way or react to it. In a it reverses the whole thing. It reverses the whole thing. And that's within subhanAllah. Meaning his attributes are perfect. I want to be, and he's inspiring me to you know, try to, to, to take on some of those attributes or to respond to some of those attributes. He's the ultimately loving. I need to perfect my love. And it'll be a lifelong struggle. And no matter how much I try to perfect my love, my love will be imperfect. He is the ultimately patient, a sabur. No matter how much patience I get in this life, my patience will never be what? Perfect. And every time my patience is short of perfect, I will remember, I can be sabir, but he is a sabur. I can, he is al-alim, and he's inspired me with a love of learning. No matter how much I learn, will my knowledge ever be, ever be perfect? No, and every time I acknowledge and realize the limits of my knowledge, I'm reminded that he is al-alim. So instead of projecting my imperfections on a concept of God, it's God's perfection that's constantly reflecting on me. <laughs> it's incredible. And that's inside subhanAllah as if to say, this da'wah to Allah is different from everything else. So ad'u ilallah, qul ad'u ilallah, and then a lot of Mufassir say, well, qul subhanallah. So it's actually ma'tuf on that. I call to Allah and I declare subhanallah. So it's those two things are, con there's a conjunction between them, right? So that's this, this incredible, incredible phrasing of subhanallah inside of this ayah. What, 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 what does this mean practically for us also? I think that there should be a, a, a comment about that. You know, we unfortunately, Muslims, non-Muslims, doesn't matter. In the modern world, we're not, let's even talk about ourselves, Muslims, we're not very familiar with how Allah talks about Himself, how He defines Himself, how He speaks about Himself, how He expresses Himself, His expectations from us, what He loves, what He doesn't love. We have notions that sometimes our parents passed along or halfway through a khutbah you may have heard something and you kind of have this hodgepodge of information and you kind of build this picture of God in your mind or conception of God, not picture, but a conception of Allah in your mind and what He likes and what He doesn't like. And oftentimes that is very twisted uh, and, and, and uh, influenced by our own emotional worldview, right? So somebody can, even a Muslim can say, yeah, I do some messed up stuff, but Allah understands. Well, you don't get to say Allah understands or you don't get to say, I have this special connection with Allah, you wouldn't get it though. I know what the book says, I'm prob it probably says something else, but he and I, we are, we're on some different level, man. We're, we're on some... This is the antithesis of what? SubhanAllah. The qul in the beginning is telling you that you don't get to decide attributes of Allah and the relationship with Allah and who Allah is to you and what He wants from you and what He likes and what He doesn't like, what angers Him, what pleases Him, how to make Him content, how to seek repentance, how to be forgiving, how to... You can't be grateful and rebellious at the same time. You know, and what do you do when you make a mistake? How do you how do you seek forgiveness? You, all of those concepts of Allah, and it's not monolith, it's not a black and white picture in the Quran. It's a it's a very intricate, you know, complex relationship which has many dimensions. You know, like you al even a person doesn't have one dimension, right? A person can have a very soft side to them, a very serious side to them. They can have an angry side to them, a joyful, a playful side to them. There are different parts of their personality. And until you really get to know them, you don't get to say you know this person. Well, that's even creation. But Allah, the perfect, has these attributes and these responses to different things that He Himself has taught us about. And if we don't care to learn that, and then we make our own you know, projections on how Allah will see things, and how Allah will judge things, that goes against what subhanAllah. And that actually, what does it do? It associates, listen to this carefully now, 
it associates concepts with Allah that Allah did not justify, right? And what is the term in Arabic for association? Shirk. Wa subhanallah, wa ma ana min al mushrikeen. You see the logical continuity here? And I absolutely will not be one. I am not one to associate with him. In other words, I will only associate with him the attributes, the conceptions that he himself authorized. Like he says, Ma anzala alaykum min sultan. Biha min sultan. Allah did not just give you any authority to attribute this, this, and this to him. Where did you get the authority to do that? In other words, I will only attribute to Allah what he authorized me to attribute. And that's inside Wama Anam al Mushrikeen. I am not one and I am not from those who commit shirk whatsoever. And this is also obviously a pretty strong declaration of Bara'a. Because I am not from the Mushrikeen. Everybody around him in Makkah is Mushrik. Man. When he says, I am not from them, isn't he saying I'm not from this tribe anymore? I renounce my citizenship. You know, they for for ancient societies, your religious identity was actually your civic identity. They were one and the same. The religion of the king, you must follow it. That proves that you are a loyal citizen of the kingdom. The people of the cave got in trouble because they refused to pay reverence to a false god. And that was a political act of defiance, not just a religious one. This is why they had to be executed. Because it was seen as defiance against the king. So the idea that when you leave religion, basically you're leaving your, your tribe. You're leaving your tribe. You're, so you leave their protection. They can see you as a traitor. Right? And that, by the way, that will be countered later on. And it's already been countered by the way the story has been told. Someone who defies the religion of the king was best for the nation in Surah Yusuf. Right? The, the, the king and his priests who do their whatever they do in their temples to interpret dreams. Obviously, they have some kind of mystical tradition or whatever they have, mythologies that they follow. And we know Egyptians have many mythologies. And he's in the middle of all of that and he declares his faith in Allah. And yet, he is the savior of that nation by Allah's guidance. Right? So me declaring that I am not from the mushrikeen does not make me a threat to this nation. In fact, the underlying current is I am the best thing even in the worldly sense to ever happen to these people. Not just in the akhirah sense. In the worldly sense, the best thing that will happen to you people is going to be me. And you know what? There's more truth to that than we can imagine. The, the Egyptian desert, the Egyptian land was going to be a barren desert had it not been for Yusuf alayhi salam, right? And Makkah was going to be a barren desert had it not been for Fath Makkah. And now Rihlat al-Shita'i was saif is a year-round thing, 1400 years going. The economy of that place is going to survive whether there's oil or not. Why? Because the Ummah will keep traveling and flooding in. There's no tourist attraction that will get more people coming in constantly and saving up their life savings to come than the house of Allah built by Ibrahim salam and restored by Rasulullah So even in the worldly sense, in the worldly sense, the best thing to ever have happened to that region is Rasulullah That's actually even continuing from the previous. But I, he, that doesn't mean that he will accept a religious worldview. وَمَا أَنَا مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ I was thinking about وَمَا أَنَا مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ because these are uh, in, my, in my work on uh, coherence and intertextuality in the Qur'an, how Qur'an is connected. Um, this, I, this statement, this phrase, وَمَا أَنَا مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ is actually an echo. It's echoing something, no surprise, something that Ibrahim alayhi salam said. The, this entire story is Yusuf tying himself to Ibrahim alayhi salam and Rasulullah being tied to Yusuf and through Yusuf also again to Ibrahim alayhi salam. We talked about the commonality between them yesterday. Now listen to what Ibrahim alayhi salam says. Inni wajahtu wajhiya lilladhi fatara samawati wal ardi hanifan fatara samawati wal arda sorry hanifan wa ma ana min al mushrikeen. I have exclusively turned my face towards the one who fashioned the skies and the earth solely. You notice the exclusivity in it? Wajahtu, wajhi, right? Hanifan, wama ana min al mushrikin. Now notice the, the use of ana in this ayah. Sabili, ad'u, ana, ittaba'ani. You see the even the, the echoes of the exclusivity and 
the I stand on my firm on this firm footing, and there's a, the repetition of the eye, and then the obviously the echoing of the face. Uh, thousands of years ago, his father said, "Wama ana min al mushrikeen," and thousands of years later, he stands before this house that his father built, and he repeats, "Wama ana min al mushrikeen." It's epic. It's so powerful, and actually, in a less direct but still very connected sense, these are similar to the words of Ibrahim of Yusuf alayhi salam in Surah Yusuf. Inni taraktu millata qawmin. I have left the religion of a people. Isn't that the same as Ma'ana Mil Mushrikeen? I am not from the Mushrikeen. He says, I have left the religion of the of a people. La yu'minuna billahi wa hum bil akhirati hum kafirun. And they, when it comes to the afterlife, they in fact are disbelievers. Wattaba'tu millata aba'i Ibrahima wa ishaqa wa yaqub ma kana lana an nushrika billahi bin shayi. I follow the religion of my father. It's not becoming of us to do shirk with Allah in any way. So these were outside of this surah. These are the exact words of Ibrahim alayhi salam. Then based the, the fundamental concept of these words has been echoed by Yusuf alayhi salam in prison. And then that fundamental concept is being echoed by Rasul sallallahu alayhi salam in this ayah when he says, وَمَا أَنَا مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ Last thing for today. And that is something that, uh, Mahat, thank you for bringing up because I couldn't stop thinking about it yesterday. <laughs> so I did some reading on this. I didn't find any Mufassir talking about it, at least under this ayah. So maybe they have talked about it elsewhere, but not in this ayah. So I did some search. Let me tell everybody else what I'm talking about. So he brought up the point that um, the ayah says, I call to Allah. I, I invite to Allah. And that's kind of an unusual phrase. Because you invite someone to a place. Or by extension, you can invite someone to a concept. I invite you to guidance. Right? I invite you to peace. Or you find in the Quran, Ad'ukum ilan najati, what's li You know what search I had to do? First, I had to do a search on da'wah in the Quran, which is 212 findings. And then within da'wah, all the places of da'wah that come with harf ila. So reduce that. So I had to read all those 212 ayat and remove all of them. And then there's lots of overlap in them. But just listen to some of these. Ya wa man ahsanu qawlan mimman da'a ila Allah. Someone who calls to Allah, sure, it's there. And then sometimes it comes with lam da'akum lima yuhikum, calls you to what will give you life. In tad'uhum ilal huda, and if you were to call them towards guidance, so calling to Allah, calling towards guidance, calling to what will give life, calling to salvation, ad'ukum ilal najati, I'm calling you to salvation, to be saved. Um, then wa ana ad'ukum ilal aziz al ghaffar. I'm calling you to the ultimate authority, the overly forgiving. Um, if you call them to guidance, they will never be committed to it. Don't become weak and call for peace, meaning call for peace with your enemy, even though they're continuously violating justice. Don't surrender. Don't call for surrender, actually, is what would be a, tr a good translation of it. Uh, Allah can bring a, a calamity to you So the, the gods you're calling towards Whatever god you were calling towards Will be exposed for what he really is So the point that I'm making is And there's lots of them And whatever you're calling us to We are in doubt about it So the thing is The, the point is You can call someone to a what Or call someone to a where so I'm calling you to truth, right? I invite you to the truth. It makes sense. I invite you to my home. It makes sense. So the, the truth would be a what? And my home would be a where? But then it's used for Allah. I'm calling you to Allah. But you never find Allah, His, His being, being a part, you never say, I invite you to a person. Like I'm inviting you to Ustad Muhammad. You, you don't say that. You can say, I'm inviting you to Ustad Maman's Facebook page, which is the place, but not the person. You understand? So you don't you invite to a being unless you find it with Allah. And actually, there is an ayah in the Quran where uh, the call is made to Allah and the Messenger. But even then, Allah first and then Messenger. Okay? Du'u ila Allahi wa ila Rasul. Because they're called to Allah and to the Messenger. So, what does it mean to call to Allah? And technically, what, what does that entail? 
what what I can surmise from calling someone to Allah, first of all, is actually a kind of majazi speech. And the idea is the imagery of a path and then a destination, right? And that destination, we finally got, we reached here. We reached a place. The ultimate place is actually the company of Allah himself. Like the, meet, the meeting with Allah is a place. So in the most literal sense, I'm inviting you to a path which will allow you to actually meet with Allah. To, to be in the company of Allah Himself. Not just the belief, the, yeah, I, I invite you to faith in Allah. You can add the words faith in and that will make sense. I invite you to believe in Allah. I, want you, I invite you to get to know Allah. But from a very literary sense, I'm inviting you to Allah as the destination so you and I get to meet with Him and He will look to us and our faces will be lit and we can look towards Him. As opposed to There will be people on judgment day He won't even look towards them Right? So when you are inviting to Allah You know uh, You'll be meeting him So the meeting with Allah is implied here But there's something even more Everything that you find in the Quran that comes after ila that's positive. I'm calling you to peace. Wallahu yad'u ila dar as salam. Ad'ukum ila al jannah, ila al najat, ila al huda. Right there, I'm, call, I'm calling you to the call is to salvation, the call is to guidance, the call is to the book of Allah, the call is to the home, the final home of peace and safety. Right? The call is to heaven. And all of those things are only worthwhile calls because they're directly connected to Allah Azza wa Right? They're all pathways to Allah. In this ayah, instead of picking one of those pathways, Allah took the umbrella term Allah, and all of that, I call you to Allah's book, I call you to Allah's guidance, I call you to Allah's forgiveness, I call you to the, the to heaven, I call you to safety, I call you to contentment i call you to harmony i call you to peace within your life everything that comes with believing in allah is included in one package word which is what allah this is actually not the only example of that in the quran where uh, the word allah encompasses more so you find for for example uh, the a, a substitute for fi sabilillah is wajahidu not fi sabilillahi haqqa jihadihi but what wajahidu fillahi haqqa jihadihi so we normally say we struggle in the path of allah right struggle in the path of allah and then an incredible ayah in surah al-hajj struggle in allah the path has been removed from the phrase as if to say what as if to make someone realize that the path itself the path itself is only a small you know, it's only a connection But the real goal is actually as if I've already I see my destination in front of me And that's Allah Himself It's as if I'm not even distracted by the obstacles in the path I just see the destination in front of me So there's this overshadowing of the word Allah Inside of the phrase, you know Ad'u, so ad'u ilallahi ala basiratin And it's actually part of the ihsan I, It should be reinforced It's part of the ihsan that um, was alluded to in this surah before So when you see When you call to Allah in that way That means you have an, a recognition of Allah's presence All the time You don't just see something as Allah's path You actually recognize Allah's presence Not just the path itself Why is that important? Because the, the, the concept in Islam For recognizing Allah's presence constantly And never, being, never not being mindful of it is the concept of ihsan, right? To be a muhsin, right? And what is a consistent description of Yusuf alayhi salam in the surah? Wa kadalika najzi al muhsinin. And you find lawla ar ra'a burhana rabbihi. He saw basically essentially God himself. He saw the evidence of God when he was in this trial situation of Allah himself, right? So this is actually a, uh, a really beautiful. Phrasing that Allah Azza wa Jal has you know, incorporated inside of this ayah قُلْ هَذِهِ سَبِيلِي أَدْعُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ عَلَى بَصِيرَةٍ أَنَا وَمَنِ اتَّبَعَنِي 
wa subhanallah wa ma ana min al uh, I would argue that this is one of the central ayat of the, this passage. There's lots of different subjects that are coming, and inshallah, when we get to the end of this passage one day, then I'm going to explain to you how all these concepts in these ayat tie together. But for now, I'm done with ayah number one, 108. بارك الله لي ولكم في القرآن الحكيم ونفعني وإياكم بالآيات والذكر الحكيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته. Which way am I going to go? Huh? Which way am I going to go? I'll go easy on you this time. Wait, this is a special move.